Hello and welcome to Beyond Boundaries. My name is Justin Douglas. I'm so pumped to have you with me today on this episode of Beyond Boundaries. If you want to learn more about me or find the show notes for this episode, you can go to pastorjustindouglas.com. You can interact there with feedback, comments, and questions, or you can reach out via Instagram. I'm at Pastor Justin Douglas. Also, please consider subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing the podcast. It really does make a difference. Put it on your Facebook page, put it on your Instagram stories, do all that good stuff that gets the word out. On this episode of Beyond Boundaries, CJ Hollowack joins me and shares his story of addiction. It is an incredible story. I was amazed at how much he has been through. One of the amazing things we get into is how our deepest pain can often become the thing that reveals our purpose in life. Like the most difficult thing you go through in life might be the thing that actually reveals your purpose. For CJ, this is very true as he is now helping others uh, who are struggling with addiction uh, and he's helping them find recovery. So cool uh, to think that the wound we are handed uh, or that's thrust upon us or that we thrust upon ourselves can actually give us an experience or perspective that allows us to provide hope and healing for others. It's my hope that this episode is encouraging to you and gives you hope wherever you're at. Here it is, my interview with CJ Hollowack. CJ, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, Justin. How are you? Good, man. I'm excited to talk to you. We got a chance to chat a little bit on the phone, and I'm excited to kind of hear a little more of the details of your story. Uh, but before we start, why don't you tell people a little bit about just like who you are titles wise, you're a student, you're also working and you're uh, tell, just tell people a little bit about what you're, what you're about. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm a full-time student at Lebanon Valley college. I, uh, I am a collegiate, collegiate, excuse me, recovery specialist for the Karen foundation, uh, as well as a counselor assistant. And what I do, I live at Lebanon Valley College with a group of guys that are in our, you know, collegiate recovery housing program. Uh, you know, younger guys, 18 to 22, uh, trying to go back to college sober, you know, so they had been through treatment previously and, uh, and want to continue, you know, going to college sober. Uh, so what I do is kind of provide oversight to them, uh, you know, drug testing, accountability, just there as like a mentor, as a guy to their point uh, throughout their college experience. That's um, so awesome. What are you going to school for? I am going for psychology right now. Okay. I'll finish up my bachelor's this year uh, and then move forward with my master's. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you got a plan to get your master's and everything. That's yeah. awesome, man. So you have um, a unique story because your life's work now is to help people who are on the road to recovery, uh, but you yourself have had um, experience in that uh you needed recovery at at, at a point in your life as well. And so like share a little bit about just your, we could start like your life story, however we want to, you know, wherever you want to start, whatever uh, on ramp you want. And then I'll just kind of chime in here and there with questions. I know we, like I said, we talked a little bit and I got to hear some of it. I think it's a pretty amazing story. And one of the things I really want to focus on today as well is just kind of how unique it is that some of the most painful things in our lives or difficult things in our lives or biggest challenges we face personally can often sometimes reveal our purpose a little bit. And it seems like for you, one of, it's interesting when one of your demons can become the energy that actually compels you to help other people with that same demon, you know what I mean? And, and, and in your story, it seems like that's the case. Is that accurate? That, that's a, that is spot on. Wow. Uh, I couldn't tell you. I mean, that was, that was perfect uh, description. Uh, it's become my passion. Yeah. Um, through my demon, through through my past. Wow. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up. So grew up in the Jersey Shore. Uh, oh, small nice. little yeah. GTL. Yes. <laughs> Always. A little snooky. <laughs> little, um, yeah, Manasquan, New Jersey. Small little beach town uh, in Monmouth County. Love it. You know, my family, we own an Italian restaurant, the Squan Tavern, since 1964. Oh, wow. Uh, so really just homey, small environment. I was like privileged and really like lucky to, I took it for granted, you know, mm. growing up in this area, um, looking in hindsight. Um, but I, I love it. And, you know, growing up, I, I had everything I needed. There was no, I wasn't, I didn't ask for anything that I didn't get. Uh, I was privileged. I was, you know, I, I, I didn't miss anything. 
Uh, my parents were divorced at a young age, but but I was okay with that. You know, it, it, yeah. for me being that young, I got two two Christmases. You know, I was it was a, it was a good thing in my eyes back then. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a good. I, I really did not have a bad childhood. My dad was a drinker, uh, nothing excessive. You know, when I was younger, but always had a beer. You know, you know, drinking at some point. Um, but I didn't think, you know, we'll get into that, but I didn't think that would become a problem, you know, later on sure. at that point. Um, in high school, you know, I'm going to jump right kind of kind of into high school. Um, when I first, you know, my first drug, okay. <laughs> I, I, I picked up, I smoked pot for the first time. Uh, I was a naive kid. I was in, you know, the hallway in the high school and I, and I bought a gram of weed from somebody and and I, uh, I Googled, this is how, you know, I thought, I looked at myself as the good kid. Sure. I didn't look at myself as, you know, a drug addict or somebody who did drugs. Uh, so I, I Googled, like, how to smoke pot out of a water bottle or something. And I, and I actually, <laughs> like, in my bedroom that night, like, made, like, a makeshift, like, bong or whatever you want to call it uh, to smoke this pot. Oh, wow. um, how old are you, 14, 15? Th- I would say 15. 15, uh, okay. Sophomore year, yeah. Okay. Didn't really do anything for me. I didn't feel much. I didn't, it, it wasn't a great experience. I wasn't like, I need to smoke pot, you know, all the yeah. time. It was just a very standard, uh, standard experience, I guess you would say. Um, and that just slowly started to progress. You know, I became, I was like an overweight, you know, kid. I, I didn't have too many friends. So the friends I did have were like, not really the partiers, but we drank on the weekends. We, we like to, mm-hmm. you know, experiment a little bit, but but I would never go like crazy. I would tell my mom, hey, you know, I'm going to drink at my friend's house tonight, but I'm going to sleep there. I'm not going to drive. Like I'm, and, and that, that was okay. Mm-hmm. That was acceptable then. You know, I was very transparent with, with what I was doing. <clears throat> um, and that slowly continued to progress, uh, drinking on the weekends, et cetera. It was when I got my wisdom teeth out that kind of this was the, the start, the beginning of the end, uh, you could call it. Um, I got my wisdom teeth out at later that year, probably would say still 15 years old. Uh, and they gave me Vicodin, uh, mm. afterwards. And I can tell you that was my first experience with an opiate and it was love at first sight. I felt confident. I felt okay with who I was internally. Mm. I felt like I could talk to people more. I was expressive. I was, you know, I just felt at home. It was the, I can't even describe it. You know, it's, it's a very warming feeling that I felt like, like I was in love. Um, I slowly, I finished that prescription bottle. Uh, they probably gave me, you know, 10, I don't remember. And, uh, and I knew I wanted more, but I couldn't. Cause again, I was the, in my head, the good kid. I didn't have issues. I didn't, I wasn't seeking drugs. I just knew those made me feel really good and they helped me sleep. That was too, uh, a, another notable experience. Um, so around the same time, my mom was dating somebody, uh, she had a boyfriend who was in an, an awful car accident and you know, this guy broke like every bone in his body. Um, and needless to say, we had thousands of opiates in our house. Oh, uh, wow. once he, this was before they were really controlled. Um, uh, so they weren't, he had multiple doctors giving him the same ones, 30 mm. milligram oxycodone, like the, Oof. these are the big ones, you know, the, the, yeah. The import, the big one. Uh, there's a market for them, I should sure, say. Sure, sure. Um, and I didn't know what they were at the time, so I Google again. Google, <laughs> Google was my favorite back then. I uh, I looked at it, and this is the moment that I realized. Now I didn't realize in the moment, but now I realize that this is when I first recognized I was an addict or had a problem. Um, I didn't swallow. I went downstairs. I couldn't sleep. And so I went downstairs to their bedroom. I took a pill. You know, I took one of Mm -hmm. these oxycodones. I went upstairs. I brought it upstairs. And I didn't swallow it like a person would with a a standard pill. I Googled how to snort a pill. Uh, Mm. I can't tell you why I did that. I can't tell you why I didn't just swallow it. But I, I ended up, I crushed it up and I sniffed this pill. I got sick. But I felt that feeling again. I felt amazing, and I slept like a baby. And mm. I was happy. At that time, I was happy. There was no consequences of any kind. They didn't know I was taking them. There was, again, so many in our house. Um, I continued this every day. I took one of these pills, like, every day. 
wow. um, for I'd say like a year. Oh my gosh, and they didn't recognize because there were so many pills. There were so many. This was like 2006 before they were super controlled. And um, I mean, they were, but not to the extent they were today. So, and And especially if he has something, some awful accident. Yeah. 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 So he had multiple doctors again, and they were just, it was unreal. Um, So I I continued taking them. Uh, I wouldn't take them during the day at school. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell friends. I didn't tell family. Nobody. This was my secret. This was my thing. Wow. Uh, I had almost a ritual. Every night I'd get home, you know, I'd do my thing and and go from there. Um, Never swallowing these pills, though. Always snorting them. Hmm. Um, So you don't even know why you snorted it as far as, like, you didn't, did you know it was going to be a more, I guess intense experience the first time you did that or did you just say i want to try this did you see it somewhere on a show or something or did you just i don't think i even saw it somewhere i think i i a more intense experience when i googled like what is this pill you know the numbers on it yeah uh you know and all these you know articles come up about oh my gosh this is what you do with these and that kind of thing and i think i was just intrigued or like by the the quote, drug scene, you know, I was, gotcha. I was intrigued by yeah. it. Um, There's how, a curiosity of like, okay, I could swallow the pill. I've done that before, but what would it be like to do it this way? Exactly. Okay. Uh, and I can, and I, yeah. So, so I followed through with that. Um, my family dynamic at the time is good. My, my grades are fine. P- things are okay, you know, externally. There's You're nothing. You're functioning yeah. Addict in some ways. Of, I'm of a functioning particular. opiate, full blown addict, wow. uh, with the world not knowing. Mm. Um, and this, so this lasts into to, to 16. Yes. So I'm 16 years old, probably going into 17 years old okay. uh, at this time. And this is my first experience with getting dope sick as we call it, uh, or okay. withdrawing. Explain that. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's withdrawal. So if you're on an opiate for a long amount of time, uh, and you stop, you stop taking it, you get incredibly sick. Your muscles, your, it's like the, the flu times 100, you know, okay. it's, it's awful. Puking, vomiting, shitting, you know, yeah. it's disgusting. So why are you getting dope sick? Did you have to stop taking it? I went on a cruise with uh, my dad okay. and my stepmom and my fam and his parents. Uh, we went on like a 10-day cruise, and I, had only, I didn't know that you actually withdrew and got sick from these, so I only brought like five of them or something, like not really thinking about it. Because again, mm. it was like a part of my life, but it wasn't like my whole world focused around it. It was just a part of, and I didn't bring enough. Uh, Mm. So halfway through the cruise, I run out and here I am in, I think we're in friggin' Belize and I'm like, you know, on the beach shivering, cold sweats, you know, puking. And I, I, you know, I sold it to them as, Oh, I must've drank in the water in Mexico or something, you know, like Mm. I, I got some bug, something. Um, So they were able to buy it. My family didn't catch on. But when I got home, this was interesting as well. The cruise docked and I got through, you know, the withdrawal, the sickness uh, over the last like five days, let's say. And I told myself, I am never going to take one of these again. Like that was pure agony. That was yeah. hell. I will not go back to that. Uh, I don't want to experience that ever again. Um, and on the drive back, the second I walked in that door, I went right to, to their medicine cabinet, you know, to take more. Mm. Um, it was just amazing how quick that changed, you know, from, from that mindset. And that's again, another example of like, you are an addict CJ, you, you have a problem. Uh, Mm. I'm telling myself I can't, you know, don't, I don't want to take more, but I have to, Mm. you know, I didn't want to, but I had to. Was there a tolerance building over this year of like, instead of just taking one, you were taking two or instead of like, or or more than one a day? Cause you said you were starting with like kind of one a day. Was there a a tolerance building in you too, to where you were like going for more and more and more? There was not surprisingly. Sl- okay. Maybe, you know, some nights I would take one and a half or, or two, okay. uh, but I, I didn't, th- not at this point had I progressed uh, okay. too far because I had, you know, again, unlimited access. Uh, I didn't see a need to do more, uh, yeah. which again, it's interesting, but it's just, that's how it, how it panned out. Sure. Um, college was the next big thing. I remember... Where'd you go to college? Coastal Carolina University. Coastal Carolina University. Where? That's like a, that's a pretty, so I'm familiar with Coastal Carolina. I've actually been there um, okay. because I was in another big South school 
I'll tell you where I went. I went to Liberty. Awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, some would say it's awesome. Some would say other things. I would be one of those ones who would say other things. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll move fast. That's for another podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I uh, I had been to South uh, uh, or Co- Coastal Carolina um, for uh, I think like a football game or something or a basketball game. Uh, mm-hmm. Been there and like it's a pretty pretty cool university, right? Because you're pretty close to like. Um, the beach and everything. You're like in, the beach, yeah, yeah. Ten miles from Myrtle Beach. It's, yeah, the it's beach right scene, there. all of it, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a so that's a. I would assume. I'm not going to say it's a party school, but I know that it, there, there's some who would ha- give it that reputation, right? Like, it was yes. I mean, okay. th- that is the reason I went there. I'll okay. say that. Uh, okay. Because I, a lot of my friends went. A lot of. I heard it was, you know, spring break comes to you for nine months out of the year. Yeah, uh, yeah I can see Beach, that. You know, I can so see that. Yeah. it was, uh, it felt like the right move in my mind. Uh, and I went through, I had no interest in school. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think I had really an interest in furthering my education at the time. It was kind of just what you did. You got, yeah. you know, you went to college. Um, so I get down there. Uh, I, I park the car and... My mom's, now I, was, I said my mom's boyfriend who had had these pills, he had a, a car that she was giving me. You know what I mean? It was my car for, to have down there. He left, he got out of the car, and I parked it, like literally at the freshman dorms, and I opened the glove box, and there's like three bottles with like 240 each of these pills in them. Uh, these oxycodone 30 milligrams. So this was like hitting the lottery for me at the time. Like, so he accidentally left him. He left him again. He had so many that he didn't even know, you know, that they were like hidden in the glove box, just not hidden, but just scripts in there. So hold on really quick. Did you have a plan going to college or were you like, I'm going to get clean off this in college. I'll party. I'll get drunk. I'll go out with friends and do that stuff, but I'm going to get off this stuff. Was that kind of the, like, did you see college as a fresh start or did you have like a bunch of stuff in your luggage ready to try to supply you. I'm just curious what your mindset was going into college. Yeah, I saw it as a fresh start. I didn't because so at this point too, I wasn't immersed in the like buying drugs from people. Exactly. Scene. Like I didn't yeah. know how to do that. You I haven't was had this, to do that. Yeah. I haven't had to. I, I was, I, I could say, I guess, lucky enough to, to not have to go through that. But I also, I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, in my head still, I'm this naive little, you know, good boy that, that doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, not the, not hanging out with the druggies or, or buying drugs. Uh, so I had a plan just to go down there, stop the pills. I would get sick for a little bit, you know, and, and move forward, but still partying. Sure. Um, and then you hit the lottery. I hit the lottery. Um, those lasted probably a month or two, all of them. Um, that is how I met every one of my friends down there. Oh, that's how you made friends. Huh? That's how I met, you know, that I got connected into my like party scene uh, or my scene of social of friends at Coastal that way uh, with the, using those pills um, as like a as like almost like a currency like hey you want a pill yeah like kind of like hey you want to hang out let's go you know let's yeah. go do a pill it's easy way to meet, meet people and I at the time again I always struggled with self worth self so mm. I felt that if I was supplying you know what I mean the drugs. Uh, people would want to hang out with me. I was not at this yeah. point like very. I was not content with who I was as a person. Mm. Uh, I needed people around me, and I didn't believe that I had that in me uh, to make friends or to you know on my own. For sure. Um, and I had been clouded from opiates for I mean like years at this point. So yeah, uh, all the decisions I made at that time. It's just an interesting like how they played out and why. Uh, I feel like there's a heavy component of, I feel like these, I wasn't, I clearly was not thinking clearly or making the right decisions. Uh, I was making decisions based on how I could continue to get high. Mm. Um, I met all, I met all my friends. I run out of these pills, like I said, about two months in and that's a pretty big deal when you run out of these pills though. Right. Because like that's, it's, you don't have your dad, your stepdad or your, you know, your Mm -hmm. mom's boyfriend there to. To kind of uh, just go grab a, a bottle of these from, or or to go um, like you've you've now got to find a different way to acquire these, or you're gonna start withdrawing. And also, this is the currency that's kind of got you most of your friends. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a that's a unique place to be. Did you have like a panic when you saw that the pills were gone, or what? I did. I your... knew I knew the time was coming. I was getting ready. I was preparing myself. Yeah. Uh, and I went through it. I, they, they ran out, they stopped. And once I got through maybe the week, week and a half, like of, of dope sickness slash withdrawal, I felt better about 
who, you know, I felt better. Like now I'm at this fresh start. Uh, there's no more pills. None of my friends at that time, even though I had supplied them with them, none of them did them on a regular basis. Nobody was addicted to opiates. Okay. Um, they just did them like socially. Sure. Uh, and so we just did it for the next like year and a half at college. I didn't do a pill. I, I smoked a ton of pot. You know, I drank a lot. Uh, I remember trying cocaine on one of my birthdays. Mm. Um, I could never, at the end of the night, this was something that stuck with me. I could never fall asleep sober, ever. Even if that meant like drinking NyQuil to fall asleep, mm. I could not at the end of a day lay in bed and just go to bed without a substance in my body. And I think a big piece of that was not wanting to be in my head. You know, like I, I didn't, I wasn't happy with who I was. I didn't like myself. And this was an escape. Yeah, a way of like numbing that voice to where you could just shut it off. 100%. Wow. And this was every night. Like I, I could not, I couldn't sleep sober. Um, I fudged my way through school. I, I got, I passed, I think, the first semester uh, the next semester, I remember my family was asking for grades and I, and I like <laughs> photoshopped, you know what I mean? The, oh, the wow. transcripts. I mean, this is how far I was going. <laughs> oh yeah. Things are going great. Look, I have all A's. Yeah. Isn't that the life of an addict though? Like the moment you, you start to like, at least this is what m- most addicts I've talked to and I hear their story. It's, it's actually kind of similar to yours, although yours lasted a little longer in the functioning, maybe. Does mm-hmm. that make sense without mm-hmm. having to lie a lot? Like, although you are stealing from, you know, your mom's boyfriend, so you're lying right up front in some ways because, you know, you're not being necessarily honest there. But I guess what I'm saying is, like, there comes a moment where you realize, like, okay, I got to start covering my tracks. And that's when, like you start to really lead like a duplicitous life. Like, uh, is that, would you say like that report card was one of the first times where you really actually like outright lied or was that something that was happening throughout your story or? So that was a, that was probably a big, a defining moment. Yeah. yeah photoshopping yeah. that. And, and you're right because that's, I started to get become a master of manipulation Yep, and I truly believed like, I don't know if there was a, a getting high feeling off of it, but I felt better knowing that I could manipulate you. Yeah. Um, that I, I could. And, and you're right. It's the life of an addict. It's when I would lie about brush. Like if my mom asked me, hey, did you brush your teeth today? Like I'd say no, even if I did or yes, if I didn't. Like I'd lie just to, to lie. Yeah. Like I found myself I couldn't <laughs> like face like reality versus this almost like made up world that I had. Mm -hmm. Uh, or this hidden world, I should say. Um, Around this time, too, when I was down there, so I I didn't have much money. I got, you know, an account. I didn't work, so I got, like, you know, family just every week, you know, a couple hundred bucks, something like that. Uh, And I started inheriting some family money, so, like, stocks. So this was a defining moment. I'm into, like, quote, my sophomore year, although credits-wise, I was probably, you know, still a freshman. Um... And I get, you know, all this like GE stock uh, and I, I sell all of it. So like $60,000 worth I sell, you know, immediately. So, okay, hold on. So, <laughs> Sorry. <it's laughs> this, a is a, this is a, this is a, this is a crazy part of your story. So you're a sophomore in college and someone passes away in your family and you inherit or some, some, some through some circumstance you inherit stocks mm-hmm. and... Someone thought it was a good idea to just hand a sophomore sixty thousand dollars in socks. Yes. So my family, they had no idea again about my addiction. So they just thought they thought oh. I would keep it in that investment account, yeah, of you course. know, and, and see it grow. There was no but in reality, in my mind, they're giving a nineteen year old mm. in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Yeah. The the keys to the kingdom. Oh my gosh, man! Um, Sixty thousand dollars. That's, that's that to wild. me at that time. That was enough to live the rest of my life. You know, yeah. in, in my head. You know, I was well, like, in oh a nineteen year old's head, you're like, holy crap, man! <laughs> you know, I could take every all my my whole dorm out for pizza. And <laughs> like, I could do, I could, like just the amount, like like the currency of that. Like, obviously, it's money, but like the the social currency that yeah. you see as a nineteen year old. I mean, because you don't really understand that friendships are built off more than like you know the you know, just basic, you know, 
buying someone a slice of pizza. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, I'm serious though. In in college, like that's a weird thing that like you can create a relationship over buying someone pizza or like, you know, your dorm mates, a cup of coffee. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, but like you realize later, like friendships are built off more than that. You know what I mean? But at, at 19, you're not really necessarily aware or cognizant of that. So like, so how does that process go? What do you do? You just go to the bank and you're like, Hey, I want to cash these out. I'm just curious <laughs> even how that goes. So it was in like a, like a, I think Charles Schwab, something like that. And you yeah. know, I had to get all the passwords and this and that, and you, you sell the stocks and then it, it was, you click transfer, you know, and it, and it went over from, from there, uh, into my checking account. $60,000. Yeah. So, so what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Uh, yeah. So ironically, of course, at the same time, I find somebody who sells these pills again, you know, down there. Uh, and and yeah. for this past like a year, I haven't really been doing them. Uh, and I find a steady source, uh, and I become, this is when I really become, I'll use the word degenerate, uh, mm. like full blown, like you could see me and know like, wow, he has a problem. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Like I just, I did not, I only wanted to hang out with you if I knew I could get something from you. Mm. That was my mentality. I didn't, you know, these friends, I slowly started to push them away. Um, my actual, that I would consider friends that I had met, you know, my first, my first couple of weeks of school, uh, I got an apartment by myself you know, I, I loved a, a, a perfect Friday night for me was being alone by myself in front of the TV with a handful of, of Oxycontin. Mm. Um, that was like ideal for me. Wow. Um, so you're probably getting even more lonely. Correct. Even yeah. more self-doubt. Like I'm, I'm just sad. You know, the depression is probably through the roof at the time. Yeah. Um, I didn't have anyone. I couldn't tell, you know, nobody knew about this. Um, so you've got more money than you've ever had, mm-hmm. more access to drugs than you've ever had, mm-hmm. more freedom than you've ever had in your life, probably. Mm-hmm. But you're like worse off for all of it. Correct. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm happy. <laughs> I, all that, yes. And then I'm happiest by myself in my bedroom. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it was a sad reality. Um, long story short, I spent all of that over the next couple months. Two um, months you spent 60000 Yeah, I was a... I'd say it would have been my junior year, so my third year of college. So between sophomore and junior year, yeah, I had spent <sighs> all of it. So over the course of, let's say, a semester, um, oh, man. it was all gone. You know, I was, my, my, up, what I was taking in went, was through the roof. You know, I was t- 10 to 15 of these 30 milligram pills a day. They're $30 a piece uh, yeah. at the time. I don't know what they cost now, but $30 a piece, uh, it adds up. You know, so for like a good day, you know, I need at least, you know, $300 to have a good day. Uh, Plus. So, so what you were as a 15, 16 year old taking one a day or maybe one and a half Mm -hmm. has now by your sophomore, junior year exceeded to like 10 a day. As many as I could get. Yeah. Wow. If the money allowed me to, like if I, I would like hit like limits on like what I could withdraw from the ATM for the day. I remember like. That was whatever I could buy, whatever I could get, you know, I would do. There was oh, no, like, wow. saving for later. I couldn't do that. Moderation wasn't, wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, it was a dark time. So when you hit zero in your bank account, what uh, happens? Because I got to believe the withdrawal now is going to be a hundred times worse than, like, off of one, like, when you're when you're doing like 10 in a row, like, or, you know, 10 a day or whatever, like, yeah. So tell me a little bit about what happens next. And the fear. So I like that you highlighted that because it's always the fear of that. You don't want to get dope sick. You don't want to get sick from it, you know? So that's in the back of your head. And so yes, when that bank account hits zero, you know, you're in for like weeks of hell. Yeah. Um, I can't describe the agony, you know, there's that it puts you through. There's some movies that document it pretty well, but, but the feeling it's just, awful. Um, this is when I truly, I hit at the time, my, my bottom, my lowest of the low. Now (laughs) I didn't know you could still go lower, but at the time this was my lowest point. I, uh, I would go to the library. I would steal people's books at the library and then go to the bookstore and sell them back, uh, for money. You know, I, I really took advantage of people. Like if I could steal from you or if I could gain something from you that would get me high, like, I would. I only 
wanted to look at you or know you so I could use you. Sure. Um, inevitably, again, it hit zero. You can't steal forever and not get caught, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it was Father's Day, I remember, uh, and I had to make the phone call home. Like I had, it, it was time. I was, I was into withdrawal. I'm like three days into it, you know, shaking in mm. bed, crying. Uh, I had finished reading this book, Scar Tissue by Anthony Kiedis, the yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers, yeah. Yeah, phenomenal yeah. book. The like last line always, it sticks in my head for some reason. The last sentence of the book is like, you know, and every time I see my dog, you know, Lucky or whatever the dog's name is, like he hasn't seen me high. So I don't get, you know, that's, it's like a big motivator for him. Uh, cause he got the dog in sobriety, but this book like really hit home, you know, Anthony, huh. he is IV heroin addict, you know, just, just very relatable. So I finished reading it and I'm like, I ha- I have to call, I have to tell my family, like it's time. I don't know what else to do. I have nothing. I'm failing. I don't even go to class. I'm failing everything. Mm. Can't pay my rent. You know, I have nothing to my wow. name. Uh, so I call my dad on Father's Day. And I remember saying, this is either going to be the best or worst Father's Day of your life, but I am a drug addict, I have a problem, and I need help. Um, mm. Shortly after that, I called mom, told her the same thing. And the next day, you know, here's my incredibly supportive family. They, you know, they get my uncle down there in a car, pack up my apartment, uh, and he drives me back home from South Carolina up to Jersey. And I remember him saying, uh, you know, really, you take the straight shots, I-95, you know, the whole way. Yeah. Uh, it's like 12 hours. And he's like, no, he's like, I'm, I'm not going to let your mother see you like this. So we're taking the long way. And we went like up the coast. It took us like three days compared to like 10 hours. Yeah. Uh, because he didn't want my family to see me in the shape I was in. Mm. Um so you would draw it over the next few days then? Oh, yeah. So I was in the passenger seat of my car. Uh, I mean, shitting, puking all over the place. It was absolutely disgusting. It was like a, a horror scene. Mm. Um, he had brought, I remember, some like Valium to help me get through it just to wow. like, you know, no, they didn't know. This was our, my family. Again, they had no idea that for years, and I'm not telling them everything. You know, sure. I'm just telling them for then, right, you know, my experience at college. Um and so what do you do? What does a family member do when somebody tells you you're an addict? A lot of families don't know. You know what I mean? They don't have yeah. people in addiction, people in recovery. So my mom, you know, made a f- few phone calls, called somebody, and I went to, you know, outpatient first, uh, intensive outpatient treatment, which is you go to some place, you know, for therapy like three, four days a week for like three, four hours at a time. Uh, and then you get drug tested and you stagger down, you know, you, you taper off. Um of how often you're there. It's not like an in, in treatment facility. Um, I do that for a month, you know, getting home, Mm -hmm. uh, constant like fights, my mom, dad, you know, me, I'm just, I'm pissed. They're pissed. Nobody's like really happy at this time. Um, and I, I wanted to get high still. I just, I wasn't done. That was the reality. I thought I had hit my bottom. Uh, I hadn't at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I kept getting high. I found ways to, like, fake the piss tests uh, while I was there to, you know, I found ways to get what I was, get what I needed. Since you're back home, are you back around some friends who stayed back and didn't go to college and have access to, to drugs and things? Is that, I mean, I know for, for, for some of the friends that I'm aware of who have dealt with addiction, Sometimes going back to familiar environments and relationships even might be the way of saying it. Mm-hmm. The friendships that uh, that are also addicts um, or, or just dabble in destructive behavior, but maybe they're able to control it not in a way you can. Does that make sense? And yeah. then that can have an influence. Did that Was that happening too, that you were reconnecting with some of your maybe high school friends? Although you didn't really get high with a bunch of your high school friends, right? Like that's, I did. that's weird. That's a weird, that's a, you're in a, you're in a, you're in an interesting category because <laughs> yeah. Because that wasn't like your high school experience, like getting high with friends. So Agreed. Uh, but I did. You, you're spot on there. I, I reached out to all the friends I knew who stayed back and still got fucked up. Yeah. That's who I went for. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, and I would, I remember going on Facebook, just like looking down, trying to find these people as, as who, you know, I could get stuff from. So you were um, looking and you were like, who's the person who was a druggie in high school? Okay. Exactly. Okay. And what do you know? I became friends with all these yeah, people. Yeah, <laughs> okay. You know, I started, you know, I was right back at it again. I was doing what I was doing in South Carolina, just back at home in New Jersey. Same uh, drugs? Same drug. drugs. Oxycodone, or? 30 milligrams. Okay. Uh, any form of opiate, really. So you're pretty consistent, at least in like not jumping to um, heroin or something like that, right? Yeah. So at the time, I, not to sound like pretentious, I had the money for these pills, sure. you know, obviously until I ran out. But I also, there was like a moral piece of it that like, I truly believed this. Like, I'm not a dirty heroin addict. Like, sure. I sniff my Oxycontin. I'm a, I'm a nice drug. <laughs> I'm yeah. a clean drug yeah, yeah. addict. And I believe that. Like, that mm-hmm. was part of my sick thinking. Um, I had later in life, like, I th- experimented with heroin, heroin a little bit, but it never became, you know, full-blown. Sure. Um, because, I, I don't know, there was just such a strong piece of me that, you know, I'm better than. Sure. Uh, and we'll get sure. into that as well, that my holier-than-thou attitude that, that I, I began to develop. Um, I also think heroin has a little bit of a stigma to it. To to where like not just a dirty drag, but also like a. When you tell me oxy, I, I think to myself like so. If you gave me oxys right now, and even I snorted them, like yeah, that's not healthy. That's not good. But if you if you gave me the option of that or heroin, I'd be like yeah, I'll go ahead with the oxy. Like it just it just has like a a, a more dangerous vibe, of course, right? Yeah. Like, and I think and I think you are still that 15, 16 year old kid that like just stumbled across this. It's not something that you're like, again, not trying to take away responsibility for the actions, but I guess I'm just saying there's still a certain naivety to just like you stumbled across Google. (laughs) It's not like you, (laughs) you've had like a guide to show you like the safe way to do some of these things. Not that there really is a safe way, but there's obviously a safer way in some cases. And, and you haven't really had that experience. So jumping to heroin would probably be a pretty, pretty big jump at this particular moment, right? Yeah. And the places I was at also, it wasn't prevalent, like in the area, you know, yeah, I had to sure. go by what was around. Um, you know, I got, I got really good at faking, uh, what is it? Um, kidney stones at urgent cares. Uh, oh, okay. and I, we don't have to get into like extreme detail, but it's very, like I was very good at it. Like, I, and that, that's a little pride coming out. That's it. But I, like I could get easy, like a script for like 30 Vicodin, like with a visit to the urgent care whenever, um, I would just Ooh. have to go to different ones. Um, mm. and, and at this point there's not the registry that exists now where you can see that this person got 30 Vicodin a week ago over here and two weeks ago correct. over there, like, which I think exists now or something similar. Yeah. Now yeah. like CVS talks to Walgreens, talks to Rite Aid, yeah. you know, they can yeah. all see what, and back then it wasn't set up like that. So you could go to different pharmacies, doctor shop, gotcha. et cetera. Um, wow. So you're back home, you're going to outpatient. Do you get a job or something? Or are you just kind of, no, I'm just kind of doing my thing. I'm working at the family restaurant. This okay. lasts for maybe a month or two, okay. honestly, before everyone catches on. Cause I'm doing, it's, it's apparent, you know, that I'm getting high. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, from the family dynamic, it's, what do we do next? What do we do now? We tried outpatient. Uh, we call our insurance and see about inpatient treatment. You know, he needs rehab. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, I, are you open to it at that time? Open? Yes. Open. I'll go open. Not like willing or not like for sobriety, but I'm, you know, all right. Sure. If you'll send me, I'll go. Yeah. I have nothing. I have nowhere to live. I I was living at home. So it's like, if you're telling me I have to go, I have to go. Um, so they did, they sent me to this place out in Pennsylvania, um, middle it's like scranton wilkes-barre area mm. um they gave you know suboxone taper they gave you for a few days mm-hmm. uh to make the withdrawal much easier tell I, people about suboxone what that is so suboxone uh you know it's like a doctors may correct me i, I don't know if i'm spot on but it's like an opioid antagonist i believe yeah. and it, inhibitor and it kinda, or something inhibitor, yeah, yeah. Is, that it, it, is that what it is is that what it's called inhibitor maybe i, don't I know. believe so yeah i feel like I've, i feel like actually uh, i talked with uh Jared Myers on my podcast and we, we got into Suboxone and he talked about it, but yeah, so, so same, same exact like thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, you know, it, it can also, it can help you with withdrawing from opiates. It latches on to like the opioid receptors in your brain. 
uh, and it also blocks you from getting high. So some people I know use it as like a maintenance program yep. as well, yep. which I did later uh, in the story, um, which we can get to. But uh, yeah, at the time it was like a saving grace. It was. You did know, you feel? It, did that help you feel better? Like as oh, far yeah. as like you didn't feel as sick recovering, but you also didn't have as much of an urge to use or I think at the time I still had the urge to use this was kind of just to get through withdrawal Um, but I did get embodied like while in while I was at this rehab by the community aspect by the you know I was I, I was intrigued like I was with that first pill like at recovery okay and what like I saw the community that it built and I was like wow like there's something to that uh, mm. these people look genuinely happy that like work here and like are, you know, in treatment, that kind of thing, uh, or in the, the local, you know, AA meetings in the area, there was, there was a piece of that that I wanted, but I wasn't ready to dive in. Gotcha. Um, I went after, after that rehab, they, they had me go to a, a halfway house in the area, uh, like a sober living bunch of guys living together, staying sober, basically, uh, and for about a year, I did that. I worked. Uh, I ended up working at that treatment center. It's not not where I where I am today. Just in like the kitchen. I got like a little job. I was plugged into the community mm. recovery community. Uh, you like met other young people in sobriety. Uh, yeah. Became like the I forget that I think they called it like the house president or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like of this sober house. Um, so you were sober for a year. Yeah. So wow. from that was when I was twenty one. Say twenty one, okay. Uh, so from or twenty to twenty one, maybe. Um, and for a year, I lived there, and I was happy. Things were mm-hmm. like good. Yeah. Uh, you know, not a bit the biggest fan of the area where I lived, but I I was happy, and I and I kept going, and I felt how I mentioned earlier how I needed to to I needed people around me. I needed to supply drugs to have mm-hmm. people around me. I think that's a big piece that latched me on was that like I didn't need anything to to have people around me. I didn't need to, to give something like in recovery in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, Narcotics Anonymous, Mm -hmm. you just, you become a fellowship. You meet people, uh, that you can have people around you without supplying something, you know? Uh, And that felt good. There was a, there was a good feeling about that. A genuine relationship with somebody that's not built on kind of some of the, the surface level yeah. stuff. And yeah. I was like new to that, like a genuine relationship, what you just said, like that was new to me. Yeah. I didn't know, you know, these were, when I stopped, I remember telling my mom, like when I stopped coming off of these pills, you're like, everything gets refreshed, like your senses, like, because you're numbing everything. So you can smell again, you can like taste again, you can feel again. And a mm. big part of that is like, there's a lot of emotions that come up. Um, that I had to work through like a lot, yeah. uh, that I had just suppressed because mentally at the time, you know, I'm still this 15 year old kid yeah. that, that first picked up a pill. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I was still immature. I was still, I still am immature, but, uh, I was, a, I was, I was a young guy giving this a shot, you know, I was, here I am, I, I struggled with the stigma of an addict at the time being in recovery and addiction. I really struggled with it. Um, And eventually, so after that year, I couldn't even tell you what happened. It's just like a snap of the fingers and I got high one day. Um, Were you at the recovery house while you were I was. I was living there, yeah. I I had gotten high uh, somewhere with friends. I don't don't even remember how it played out because it was so quick. Um, Was it Oxy again or was it something else? It was Oxy. Mm. Um, And then I knew something had to change. So in these scenarios, I like to either run away, you know, or I don't like to face things head on at the time. I really like to run away from my problems. Sure. So obviously I have to leave this sober living place. Like I I have to move somewhere. My mom and dad are like, well, you're not coming home. Um, So I said, okay, I'm going to move to Florida. And like the spont- spontaneity of that, like I mean, I literally it popped into my head. I'm gonna move to Florida. I pulled some remaining last stocks that I had, found an apartment down there, and picked on a map Clearwater, Florida, and said I'm gonna go there. Uh, oh, <laughs> I had wow. talked about and like 
like these were the spontaneous crazy decisions that that I would make like just life altering just again snap of a finger um I got in my car I packed it to the brim and I and I drove to like 24 hours down to Clearwater Florida uh wow. my degree what I was going for at coastal but not really going to school was resort tourism management so I had always liked the hotel industry the resort industry okay. and I thought there might be something cool down there uh, but I didn't know. I didn't have anything set up. So I went down, but I went down with the intention on getting high. Sure. Uh, so I drove down there. With and the intention on being alone again, too. Correct. Like Away a, from a, family. A, a way even to just like go back to a similar experience of like sitting in your room alone on a Friday night, getting high without any consequence, without anybody being aware. Correct. So, wow. Yeah. Um, so I get down there, uh, and the Suboxone, this is where, so I, I get a dirty doctor. Uh, at the time there was a lot of dirty doctors down there and yeah. I, I find one, uh, and he it was $500 cash. Uh, and he would say, what would you want? What do you want? And he would write down oh. whatever you wanted on the prescription. Now I wanted at this time, I had had this taste of sobriety and I wanted some normalcy to my life, so I started Suboxone maintenance. You know, I was okay. taking uh, rather than you know getting opiates, but he was still he was giving me more than like I should have. Ta- I was getting like ninety a month or of these eight milligram strips, so I was taking twenty four milligrams a day, um, and it got me through my day. I wasn't. It, I felt. It's like I know it's like kind of. I felt. Like, I was almost high a little bit. Like, I felt good. I had a little bit of that opiate feeling when I was on Suboxone. Um, but I couldn't actually, like, you know, do pills. I wasn't blowing all my money on pills, that kind sure. of thing. So it You it, were functioning in some ways, right? Yeah. To kind of, like, functioning. Yeah. Like, it brought some normalcy to, uh, to my life. And so I got a job at this local, uh, a really, like, a really shitty, like, hotel, uh, and I don't want to say the name, but I, so I get a You're job fine. there. <laughs> I get a job there um, working like not, this wasn't like a resort. And so I'm working at night, the front desk, and it was a smaller hotel. So it was only me and like a housekeeper there at night or something, or like me. We were the only staff members on this on second shift. Okay. And this is after a few months of being down there in Florida. Um, I would, this is where, where things get a little dark. Um, I would, People would come up to me at the front desk and they'd say, hey, you know, where, where's a good place to go to dinner? And I'd say, oh, you know, go to this place. It's about 30 minutes away. You know, mm-hmm. I'd pick somewhere a little further away and I would immediately then go to their room with my master key, go through their luggage and take any medication that they brought. Oh, wow. I mean, talk about like. Like intruding on people, like like people's yeah. privacy, like oh of my course. god, like this is like sick, and this is where I was at, um, and I would I would have them do that, uh, and I found that like ninety percent of people travel with Ambien, Xanax, Clonopin, some sort of benzodiazepine, mm. uh, always, and so I did this like for like months, a while, mm. uh, whenever the pre- like opportunity presented itself to me, this is what I would do with it. Um, I got caught. Uh, um, somebody walked in, <laughs> you know, I told them to go somewhere. They forgot something in their room and here I am sitting at the counter going through their medication. Uh, and they walked in oof. and I free, you know, crying. I remember screaming, I'm a drug addict. I'm sorry. And I like ran away. Oh my uh, gosh. I like quit the job right away. Obviously police get involved. Yeah. Um, they call me. You know, again, there was no serious consequence. Uh, I had gotten a, an attorney, um, and it never even went to court. They tried because they couldn't prove I took anything uh, from oh, them. Oh, wow. And I guess I'm not admitting right now that I did or didn't. Yeah. But, uh, so it was dropped. It was never, there was no, you know, Yeah. I, I, I didn't get arrested. Nothing happened. Um which is another reason why I think I continued to do, like continue to be in that mindset and continue to, to, to get high because I had yet to face like serious consequences. 
yeah. um, or that I viewed as serious. Um, so you're still in Clearwater, Florida after all that happens, yeah. you find out, all right, I don't, I, I was able to, to get out of this, didn't even go to trial, didn't even get any, you know, anything other than obviously I lost my job. I got to figure out a new plan for that. But what do you do then? Do you stay in Clearwater and you find another job or what happens? Next? Yeah, I stay in Clearwater and I say, I'm going to go work for this massive mega resort on the beach. Um, and I do. I get the mm. job. So, again, I'm like a great manipulator at this point. I was able to clean myself up enough to, to be able to get, you know, a, a pretty decent job at a really nice resort. Um, and continued Suboxin. This is while still on Suboxin. Yeah. Now, my doctor at the time, I, I throughout this, I'm down there for like two or three years, you know, working. Okay. Uh, family relationships are good. They know I'm on Suboxin. But then the doctor, you know, I'm like, listen, man, I, I really can't sleep that well at night. He's like, okay, well, here's uh, here's Ambien. You know, we'll give you Ambien to help you sleep, which is basically a, a benzo. It's a, it's a yeah. narcotic. Um, then I said, well, you know, I'm really stressed out sometimes during the day. And he goes, okay, well, here's some Valium. You know, we'll give you mm. Valium too. And I'm like, listen, doc, you know, and this is over time. But, hey, I have panic attacks sometimes. You know, they really worry me. Okay, yeah, you need Xanax. So, so here I am, you know, at the end, I'm down there for a few years and I'm on an, you know, obscene amount of Suboxin, Xanax, Valium, and Ambien to sleep. Oof. I'm like a walking, like zombie. emotionless zombie. Yeah. 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 I just felt nothing. I saw nothing. I, I just went through the motions. Um, hmm. And again, this is all by myself. You know, there's no one down there. I'm, I'm down there by myself here and there. My dad, and my mom would come visit. But it was it was pure isolation. Uh, what what I wanted at the time. Uh, What's the next thing that happens? Then you're working at this resort. Do you go back to stealing again, or are you no, able to keep that No, it wasn't that, that type of position. It was it yeah. was a it was like behind the front desk type of thing. It was more like behind the scenes. Gotcha. Um, and life is okay for it's kind of on autopilot for sure. I'd say like a year. Uh, it's very just go with the flow, go with the motions. Have you built bridges back with your parents in this time at any point? Because obviously you've ran away from the problem. Are you t are you convincing them that you're sober now, or are you just telling them, "Hey, I'm getting by down here. It's good. You should come check it out." Or how how's your relationship with them? It's getting better. Season? They knew about the Suboxone. They didn't know about anything else. And I just kind of played it off as like, oh, yeah, it's just this drug. It helps me not get high. Mm. Uh, and that's it. You know, and they so, yes, our relationship was getting better. But again, I was still a very sick person with a sick mentality uh, mm -hmm. and was manipulating them, you know, constantly. There was I would still come up short for rent sometimes and have to ask my dad for money, ask my mom for money to pay bills. I could still pay them like they would get paid, but I was still struggling. Sure. Um, so next, uh, so I get a phone call. I had mentioned earlier that, you know, my dad was a drinker, um, you know, throughout his life. Uh, and I get a phone call from my stepmom saying, hey, you know, your dad is sick. Uh, I need you to come home like tomorrow. Oh, wow. Uh, so I fly home. Uh, and he's, he's got like liver and kidney, you know, they're like failing his liver and kidneys as a result mm. of his alcoholism. Uh, mm. you know, he was drinking a ton of vodka daily, apparently for years. Is this the first you're finding out about how, how serious his addiction was or did you no, know? No, I had known previously. Him? He had been okay. to, I, I didn't mention this earlier. He went to rehab once okay. during, uh, when I was, I think in high school, um, but never maintained sobriety. Sure. You know, he, he always, you know. But again, he was, I guess you could say functioning. He had yeah. a great job, a house, a wife, a great, you know, like he was, yeah. he had gotten a DUI though, lost his license. Okay. So there was, there were, there is some, some backstory. I didn't know. So there were some externals, but for the most part it was semi-manageable. Mm -hmm. How did you know, did you know his health was deteriorating or is this kind of the first you're finding out about it? I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had no idea and it happened so quick. Mm. Um, so I fly home. You know, I'm on the next flight. I spend about a week with him. Uh, and he, they think he might, like, get better. You know, they're like, okay, like, yeah, sclerosis of the liver, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, there's, a, there's a chance he'll pull through. You know, it's, it's 
I left Florida feeling, or I left New Jersey for Florida feeling optimistic uh, that he would be all right. Like I, death was like the farthest thing from my like. I couldn't even imagine it. Um, and and probably two days later, after getting back to Florida, my stepmom calls me and says, "Your dad, he died. He died mm. last night uh, in the hospital. They had flown him, you know." like life lighted him to a hospital and, and he died. Um, now the first, this is again to, to show you where, where my mental state was. The first thing, Justin, before I called my mom to tell her, before I went home from work, before I did anything, I called my psychiatrist and told him that I needed to come see him for an appointment immediately. Mm. So my first thought upon hearing the news of my father's death was to call my psychiatrist to get Xanax. Mm. And that's what I did. Like mm. I, I didn't, like, number one is... Numb it. it, it numb, numb it, it now. It, numb don't it now. feel a thing. This hurts. You know, this hurts. Wow. Yeah, run away. So I, I, I did exactly mm. that. And then I, I called, you know, my mom, et cetera. I came home for the funeral. Uh, I was, like, nodding out at his eulogy you know, I, I, I was a mess. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to do, how to handle life. Uh, I was, I was very broken, but I didn't, I didn't face it. You know, I didn't, I didn't confront it. Uh, it was just numb it and just continue taking, you know, meds. And then the inheritance came into play. Um, I inherited uh, maybe like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, two hundred thousand oh from my him. Gosh. Now this again, I somehow convinced my family. You know, some of it was in stocks, this and that, and I manage a way to get it into my checking account. Oh, Literally, wow. I remember like looking at the ATM receipt with like you know that much money, you know, in, in available balance. It didn't even make Oof. it to the savings; it was all on the debit card. Um. Shortly after, you know, I'm becoming a degenerate gambler. I'm going to the casino, you know, $500 a spin. You know, I'm looking for anything external to give me, you know, something, uh, to get, to have me feel something. Feeling uh, victory or yeah, feeling like something. A, a high of some sort. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm hitting $60,000 jackpots at the casino and then losing it all the next day and driving home wanting to die. And it was, I mean, the, the, I had gotten off Suboxone uh, so I could start getting high again, back to the oxycodone. Um, I was just in a downward spiral that there wasn't a coming back from, it seemed. So my family, again, uh, I didn't want to go to treatment. They called and said, like, you need to. It's time, like, you're, what the fuck, CJ? Like, it's time yeah. to go back to rehab. So I saw a commercial uh, on TV for Passages Malibu. We have the <laughs> cure, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, are you an addict? I used to be. Now I'm not. Uh, and I said, well, if I'm going to rehab, I'm going there. I'm going to Malibu. Uh, and I won't go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, again, so I, I really developed when I inherited this money a very I'm better than you attitude because I have money and you don't. Yeah. Uh, and I truly, my ego, it was, like, huge. Mm. Uh, but I was li I was. It was absurd, you know, how, how... People treat you different when you have money, though, too. So, mm -hmm. like, once they realize you have money, you've probably got people around you making, like, enforce, reinforcing that feeling, too, huh? Correct. I would assume. You're going into a casino with a bunch of money. They're like, oh, hey, how are you? Yeah, the casino <laughs> host calling me, inviting me to all these things, you know. Yeah, they want to they wanna get to know you. Mr. Uh, Holowack, how are you? Come on over here. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this is... Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I uh, I thought again. This is enough money to last for the rest of my life. You know, yeah. uh, it's not. Um, so do so you go, I go to Malibu? I go to Passages Malibu. Oh, I want okay. to. I, I want to be cured of addiction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they sold me uh, from the commercial. <laughs> uh, so I get on a plane and I go. Um, I was very sick for a while there. Um, I actually I was still like. Withdrawn from so many benzodiazepines, you know, the Xanax, Valium, and opiates, like the shakes and everything, 
were so bad. So I was there a month, which was like an obscene amount of money and my family couldn't pay more. Uh, so somebody there just paid for me to stay an extra two weeks, mm. um, while I was there. And it was this, cause my, my withdrawal, it just, it was so long, you know, it was like, honestly, it was like a five week, you know, withdrawal. Um, but that place reinforced for me, I didn't really get much out of it because I was still, I wasn't done yet in my head. This was my family again, sending me to treatment. This wasn't like me wanting yeah. to go. Um, I went, I, I met great people. I met great friends, people I still talk to today, actually. Um, but I, I felt like all like bougie, you know, like I'm better, like, oh, I'm in this night. You get the sure. huge bed, the cleaning lady. Yeah. I don't know. Just like, yeah, the, I felt it really reinforced the, the false ego. Um, and so I'm there for six weeks. I come home and, you know, I get a text that every, all my scripts are ready at CVS. Huh. And so I, you come home to cl- Clearwater. Yep. I fly back to Clearwater. I had just spent $90,000 at a month at Passages Malibu. Uh, and I go right to CVS and pick up all my prescriptions. Um, and it's it's just like, re- like right back to where we were, but worse. Um, I'm starting to black out constantly. Two psych wards I go to during this. I call this like the dark ages period of my life. Uh, two different psych wards. One, I was running around my apartment complex naked. Uh, I had no idea. And oh, thank wow. God my landlord was like, she, God, God bless this lady. She's an angel. And she didn't want me to like, go, she knew I had a problem. She didn't want me to go to jail. So she like convinced the police officers that I was just like mentally like sick. So she got him to take me to, uh, oh, wow. a, a, a psych ward rather than jail. Um, I do get arrested though at one point for stealing from Walmart. Um, I, (laughs) I spent all of my dad's money over the course of nine months. Uh, so 150 to $200,000. Yeah. Somewhere in there. I had bought a brand new car, sold it, traded it for a moped. So I didn't have to pay car insurance. I mean, all of it gone. Um, wow. Where are you at after that nine months when that account zero now? (laughs) That was, it was like, it was almost like suicide time. You know, it was, it was time. It was, there was nothing left. I had nothing. My family was done. You know, they're like, listen, we have supported you through so much bullshit. We're done. We can't like keep, keep enabling you. Like, and I respect them for doing that. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. that's, that's what in turn, like I needed that. Um, they have, there's actually a video. So we're an Italian family. We have like the, the seven fishes, the nice Christmas Eve, the big, mm-hmm. big ordeal. And there's like, you know, 50 of our, of our family members, you know, in the room. And, uh, and they filmed, my mom has this video of like basically them giving me a eulogy, like saying goodbye while I was still like alive, alive, obviously, but like my family knowing that I was going to die. Um, wow. What did they do with that video? They sent it to you? Yeah, my mom did. Ooh. I don't think I've watched it since. Uh, I don't think I even have it on my phone. I think I delete. My mom has it. But it uh, it was, I mean, it's like all of my family members saying goodbye to me. Uh, that hit home. I'll bet. Yeah, that hit home. Because without, I had nothing. I had nothing already. And then to lose my, fa- my, my family. Yeah. I felt like just... Those are the only genuine relationships you probably have at this point, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I milked, you know, I I milked the whole, oh, my dad's dead. You know, like I honestly, I used that for pity. Um, I had a dog at the time, this, this Chihuahua and this, this plays into the very end here, how I got to treatment. Um, I was doctor shopping with my dog. So I had this dog that dogs take like twice the prescribed amount of Xanax that humans do. Uh, They metabolize it differently. So they they get prescribed. So he's just this tiny, maybe 15 pound dog, but he was getting prescribed what, you know, like two milligram Xanax bars, you know, 120 of them a month. I had made up this whole fake like paperwork on his anxiety disorder that he had. And like, like I, and I would go to different vets. Um, I would go to different pet co's and pet smarts and these places that, 
you know, had uh, a vet in them and they would just dispense the medication because that was the loophole. So Florida, Florida started monitoring all prescriptions after their big crackdown, you know, yeah. at different pharmacies and whatnot. But pet, but vets didn't. They didn't get put in the system when you went to the vet um, if they filled it there. And humans could take this. It's similar. It's the it's, exact same. It's Alprazolam. Okay. Exact same name wow. brand. Xanax. You know, exact same. Uh, so this. That's crazy. That's I, the I'm, craziest. That's the loophole only a drug addict will find. Correct. Who thinks like, of that? Like, like, who thinks of that? That's exactly. Like, it's absurd. The, quite honestly, drug addicts at times shock me with how creative they are. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to say it, but like, <laughs> it's like, of course, you would have a chihuahua and be like, you know what? Their metabolism is different. And so they give them more so we can figure it out. Like, yep. it's just the most random thing. So but at the same time, crazy. when I talk to people who have gone through recovery, they almost all have some like random creative way that they found to get high in the midst of a season when they had no means to do it. And you're just like, wow, that's, it's amazing how much of a driver it is in your life. That yeah. you'll use all your creative energy to figure a way to get high, like something like that. That's Anything I can. Yeah. yeah. And so, this, this is what, how my, oh, keep going. No, so, no, I was just going to say, so how long does that last? You start, you start getting high off doggy yeah. drugs. <laughs> off doggy, <laughs> off doggy Xanax. Uh, this was the, the beginning, the, the end, the, my road to treatment. Uh, it kind of, it plays out as, so the, the pet stores eventually find out that oh, I started using out. different last names. I'm like changing oh. two letters in my last name to this, going to this pharmacy, this vet, this. Like I hit like every friggin' vet within like 50 miles of me. You know, mm. it was absurd. And so I get a knock at my apartment door one day uh, and I open it and it's a guy just dressed like plain clothes. Uh, and he says, hey, my name's, you know, agent blah, blah, blah from the DEA. Ooh. Um, and my heart dropped. I bet. He goes, uh, we know what you're doing. We'll be watching. Hands me his card and walks away. Talk about dropping the mic. Like this was like, I was already a paranoid, freaked out mess as it was. And now, yeah. you know, an, a, a local DEA agent just came to my door and told me that he's, they're going to be watching uh, and just leaves. So <laughs> this, this is my my what I believe to be my true like bottom. You know, my family wants nothing to do with me. The DEA is on me for doggies annex. Yeah. Like I'm like, it's time, you know, it's time to, to give it up. Um, so I, again, I had no money. I had nothing left to my name and I emailed, <laughs> this is the last piece of my, my ego. It, it still had to hang on there a little bit. My dad had gone to treatment at this place, Karen, uh, and so I, I didn't call their admissions or anything like that. I, I emailed their CEO <laughs> because, <laughs> because that's what I do, you know, cause I'm better than, uh, that like, that's oh, truly, this is my mental state at the time. Uh, <laughs> I emailed their CEO. Um, I, the email ends up getting passed off and, and I get, they give me a full, like a scholarship, a full scholarship to this treatment center. Uh, oh, wow. Which, I mean, is is expensive because my family was just not willing to support me. My mom initially, she was pissed that I got into a good treatment center. Like, she wanted me to go, like, somewhere in the woods, you yeah. know, some, like, boot camp in the woods. Yeah. Like, she thought that's what would be best. She's um, like, we don't need another Malibu. No. Yeah. <laughs> so she was, like, pissed. But I was like, listen, I, you know, they, they, they scholarship this entire thing. And, and so... I go into this. This is the first time I'm going into treatment that I want to do it for me. You know, I, I need to get better. I want to get better. My family's not pushing me there. Uh, I go to every, I don't miss a group while I'm there. I don't, you know, I take advantage of like every opportunity I have. I'm talking to everybody. Um, cause I, at that point, treatment's the easy part. You know, it's like, what's after it's like, yeah. it's the hard part. Treatment's easy. Treatment's and you had hard. a year of sobriety to kind of know a little bit about that process out of uh like into like a group home and, and like you you mm -hmm. knew what it was going to take right yeah, yeah. I, I i definitely did and i went in open-minded like tell me what to do and i'll do it yeah luckily i had this counselor that i mean she could see right through my bullshit it was like it was amazing she called me out she 
you know, and I, and I just tell me, tell me what to do and where to go and I'll do it. Mm. I need, I need help. I cannot live like this anymore. Like I'm desperate. Mm. Um, so, and just very quickly how it, how it ties into what I do today. Uh, we have the service Sunday chapel, chapel service at, at, uh, at Karen every Sunday. And it's beautiful to anyone who like plays music, any patients that play music can get up there. People get, you know, two year coins, alumni, multiple year coins, mm-hmm. uh, included in like a chapel, like spirituality service. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm probably, I'm doing a disservice by, uh, <laughs> not describing it as well it is, as it is, but it's, it's unbelievable. And so I'm sitting there in the back uh, with my mom. Parents can come visit on Sundays. You know, they're allowed to come with you uh, to chapel. And my mom's sitting next to me, and a group of all the, the young adults, the young adult males, like, walk in. These are, like, mm-hmm. teenagers to, like, you know, college-age kids walk in. And she goes, like, CJ, she goes, look how, look how young they are. She goes, don't you wish you could like tell them how bad it gets? And right there was the moment when I knew what I was going to do. Oh, wow. I said, mom, yeah, I want to tell them how bad it gets and I'm going to. Mm. And that, I mean, I cannot tell you the motive that I was driven to like, I am going to help people do what I couldn't do. Mm. Uh, which took up 10 years of my life. You know what I mean? This active addiction, like I am going no matter what, like, this is what I'm going to do. And I, pers- and I did it. <laughs> I, I went to, uh, a halfway house in the area local to Karen, um, for nine months. Uh, I needed that long. <laughs> this place yeah. called transitions, amazing transitions and recovery really taught me, you know, the foundation of like getting connected and, and, and really becoming a part of a community. Um, while I was there, I worked on my family relationships, my, you know, every, you know, yeah, really whole circle. But you're working the steps. I'm, I'm working the yeah, steps. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. actively working with a sponsor. You know, this was like, this was real. Yeah. It was finally happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the promises were coming true. There's promises in AA and like they were coming true. Um, after like six, seven months or there or something, I get a, I get a job. I applied to Karen. Cause I knew again what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but all they had open at the time I remember was like a driver. So I'm like a, a bus driver kind of driving people to lunch. <laughs> yeah, like nice. honestly transportation like, department, anything that'll get, to me get in. in the door. Yeah. yeah. And I, cause I was so towards that end goal. Like I am going to do something with these young, with these young guys and like help them succeed. There was just such a piece of me that I failed at this. I want to help them not fail. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a driver for six months, you know, uh, then get hired as a counselor assistant on like young adult male, teen male services, you know, that, that program, um, and, and, and get to, uh, get to experience, you know, help what this is like. Um, now around about a year ago, uh, while I'm working there, uh, I got this opportunity from uh, from the guy, the man who scholarshiped me uh, to Karen, um, the chief clinical officer. Okay, Dave Rotenberg. He he was like has been like my mentor uh, throughout this whole process, and, and he said, "CJ, I want I'm trying to start this like this collegiate recovery. You know, this the, a, a sober dorm at a local school." Like he had a he had a vision for it of what it would look like, uh, and he's like, "I need someone to 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 run it." to like live in it. Wow. Uh, and I, I was like, Oh my God, like, okay, this is, this is a big deal. Uh, yeah. I said, yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. You sign me up, you know? Uh, so that's how this started. Uh, we started at Alvernia university, a local, you know, school in Reading, um, with me, uh, and a few of my coworkers who helped kind of like write this program and what it would look like, you know, um, and had, we had six guys move in for, for, a, a, a active recovery housing, like on campus. I think that was the biggest piece that it's a house on campus. It's not, you know, separated. It's not, there's not a sign that says like where sober people live. You know, it's a <laughs> bunch of guys living together, uh, 
going to school. You know what I mean? Like, like people are like, <laughs> it blows me away and it blew me away. Like how you can go to class and like actually learn something when you're not sniffing Oxycontin before you go. Yeah. You know, like I didn't know that. You yeah. Know? Uh, if you don't go to class <laughs> drunk, like, like better things, ha- you get better grades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that, so it's an odd thing that happens there. <laughs> yeah. Like that small of a concept. It was like, wow. Okay. Uh, and that's how this, this initial, you know, program started and, and kind of took me into the direction of what I'm doing now. And, um, it continued to grow. You know, mm-hmm. we, we expanded, uh, we had the opportunity to, to, uh, come to Lebanon Valley college, yeah. uh, up here and same concept, a house, middle of campus, you know, right there, you know, right yeah. in the swing of things. Um, so I spent about a year at Alvernia, uh, getting that, you know, kind of off okay. the ground and then transitioned over to, to LBC to start, to start over here. How um, many colleges that you're aware of have recovery houses on campus? Is that a thing? I, I mean, that seems like a pretty cutting edge idea. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just unaware. No, there are. So there's a good amount, but they're not to the extent like they're not as in depth or advertised or marketed like okay. like kind of ours is like they're not so I know Rutgers I think Rutgers has like an amazing one that's been around forever like okay. there's some like bigger schools that definitely have them um or smaller like hey oh yeah we have this you know serenity room that you can go to and talk to a counselor if you want like that's our recovery program on campus uh, okay. um you know, what I think separated us or made us more unique is that we had, you know, backed by the Karen, by Karen, uh, you know, a full, mm-hmm. just a better understanding of what we wanted to do. You know, a lot of resources and school. a lot of experience, would be my guess, right? Like, I mean, because Karen does stuff beyond this and knows how to aid people in recovery. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, getting guys stable on meds, that whole, you know, there's so many pieces to figure out, even just like, like psychiatry, this, that, you know, and, and, uh, Howard Murray, my coworker who, who kind of like, you know, runs LVC with me and, and Greg Krikorian, the dean of the school has just made it so possible to, to thrive. You know, we don't need, we don't like, if we need something like we get it and, these guys are just, um, it, it, it like brings tears to my eyes thinking like, so these guys just, they mix into school. They're achieving, like they're like 18, 19 years old. Like mm-hmm. some have had previous college experience. Some it's their first time, uh, going to school, but they're getting that experience. Like, and they're happy. You know, yeah. we've had, I've had, I had a guy with a transfer in with a 0.2 GPA and last semester finished with a 3.7 on the dean's list. You know, like that's, that's that to me, like that's what wow. not drinking and drugging does. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. You don't know your potential if you're no. in that space. And to see like, <laughs> so I got to see my relationships with my family like blossom over the years, you know. Now I get to see it happen for others. Yeah. And getting to see and be a part of that and like yeah. talk to their families and see these guys like, Getting happy and like really like joining teams, like guys on the esports team, on the football, yeah. on the basketball team, you know, like yeah. that, that, that's what, when I was in chapel with my mom, when, when I said, I will help them, I will tell them how bad it gets like that moment. Like that's what I see myself doing now. Like I, I can only imagine like when these guys start to graduate uh, we're expanding, so we're building it. We're not building. We're moving t- uh, these guys who have been with us for a year now to a step-down house uh, and bringing in new guys, you know? So wow. um, the growth is is huge. That's amazing. I was a youth pastor for 12 years, and um, it's amazing when you start to see your students, um, like, get married and have kids, and, like, you, you start to see, oh, my gosh, man, like, this is wild to see the the short influence you had in their life but like the the way you can stay connected via social media and other ways now as people move away and stuff like but the impact you're having I'm sure um it'll be even more amazing when when some of those milestones happen in some of these people's lives because I mean you've you'll have played a role in in like 
a very crossroads type moment in their life of sobriety. Like that's, that's pretty phenomenal and amazing. I think it's, it's so great that I, I think a lot of people, um, struggle to see how their deepest wound might actually reveal, um, their great purpose in life. And, and I don't think that's just recovery. That could be any number of things that, 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 the thing that has really um, been a very difficult circumstance to work through or even a tragedy that you've had to endure can be something that can provide um, a meaning, a purpose, a drive, a direction. Uh, And it seems like in your story, uh, that's so, um, so much part of your experience that you had this thing. And then the moment you, you started getting, clean and and really committed to it, you were able to catch a vision for how, um, how you could actually help people that were in your circumstance back here, how you, you in some ways. So here's the deal. Like I could go talk to somebody and I've read like multiple books on recovery. Um, I've talked to multiple people that have been in recovery. I know I would know probably for the most part, most the right things to say in the right situations in the mm-hmm. right scenarios. I don't know. Obviously I'm not an expert, but I mean, I could get the education and yeah. learn how to, how to be a good counselor to people who are in recovery. But I do think it's something different when someone's able to talk to you and be like, I've been where you're at yeah. and I know the roadmap out of here, man. Yeah. Trust me. You can't go that way. Yeah. It's not going to be good. You have a certain ability to like use that experience. Um, and, and you just, there's a, there's a trust you're able to build that others aren't able to because you've journeyed down that road before you've journeyed down that path. And there's just an extra level of like, there's also a, uh, a, a a BS detector that you have that others don't because you know, (laughs) because you were a master manipulator at at those times, right? Because that's kind of what it takes to be a functioning drug addict, right. Is to manipulate, like you said, and like, and so you're able to spot that probably faster than most. Is that, so are, is all that pretty true of your experience like so far? Yeah, uh, it it is. Um, we, you know, it's very, uh, there has to be a lot of, a lot of experience behind it. And, and with like, you got six guys fresh out of, you know, a, a month, two months, three months in treatment, uh, yeah. Getting a lot of freedom. You're going from a very high level of care to a, you know, to um, a college campus. College campus, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a lot of trust and rapport building we did in the in the beginning, but we did. I wouldn't even say we got lucky. Like we we just have a great. We did get lucky. We have a great community that you know. If I need to call somebody out, like they know why, or or they, yeah. they know what's up, mm-hmm. um, and we have you know community meetings on Sundays. We will. We come together every Sunday for like two or three hours, myself, Howard Murray and and the guys. And we just talk about, you know, we have a list of questions. What happened this week? Did you get triggered this week? Did, you know, homework, this, that, and the other, um, just to stay on top of everyone, you know, random drug tests throughout the week. Like we, we come together as a whole, like I like to use summer as the example. Some guys will be like, well, what do we do during the summer? You know, uh, it's going to be boring or this and that. Besides working and going to class, like we're going to be bored together. Like we can be bored together. We can do stuff together. Like even if it's so, the program bored. continues over the summer. They stay in the house over year the round. Three sixty five. That's because good because going home for the summer could be probably a difficult, yeah, uh, thing to endure for someone who's pretty fresh in recovery, right? Yeah, it's easy to go home. I think and get you know triggered too. Like yeah. I in the beginning, you know, just going home on like home passes, uh, you know, even for a couple days, like you can get people, places, and things, you know, that make you, bring you back to that. Bring Um, you back to a moment of shame or a moment of guilt or a moment of, yeah. Exactly. So we like to be cautious of that and we like to, you know, keep everyone. And like I said, as you progress, you're with us for maybe a year, you know, you can move on. You've, you've grown enough to step down, you know, you still get drug tested, Mm -hmm. still meet with us, but more freedom. The goal is to cultivate independence to a certain extent, right? Like it's not that you're always going to have us on, like we're always going to be here and you're going to be under our wing, but like that you would have, you know, be under our wing while, while it's necessary, but ultimately grow your own wings to be able to be on your own. Right. Yeah. I mean the message of like, like hope really, it's just like, like that's what we're pushing. Just 
to, to be able to, to graduate school on your own. I don't, I don't want you always living in a sober living environment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, to keep going, do what you have to do and, and, and gain from this what, what you deserve, you know, and live like a meaningful, meaningful life. I mean, I, I don't know. That's, that's our goal. Yeah. So I have a personal question to ask in relation to even you as a 15 year old to you throughout your drug addiction, you had mentioned multiple times, like you didn't really feel okay with yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, you didn't have a whole lot of self-worth shame. Um, how obviously drugs numb that, right? Mm -hmm. So, so like the drugs numbed whatever voice in your head was saying, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe there was a feeling of like, I'm not lovable or I'm not, I'm not a good friend or whatever, whatever all the, the voices were in your head. Everybody has those voices in their head. You know what I mean? And so maybe someone's listening who, who, who's gone through that or is going through that. Once you start to get sober, those voices return. Like it's not, it, all you did was hit the pause button. Like, does that make sense? You didn't work through it. You didn't work through Absolutely. the voices that are saying those things. And so I think so much of when you look at people relapsing, um, they in some ways succumb to those voices again. Does that make sense? Like I really do think so much of addiction is rooted in shame. And the moment you shame an addict even more, you're really not, you're not, you're almost in my, in my experience and also in my, I guess, study of different um, people's philosophies with addiction. Like there's just this sense of like um, shaming an addict even further might help them hit rock bottom to determine to get recovery. It might work that way, might. but it also might um, just further deepen the voice that's that's ultimately constantly going in their head. Does that make sense? It like, does. Um, and so, so how explain a little bit because there's some people who who are addicted to food, and it's more of a an okay at least um, socially acceptable addiction might be the way of saying it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but they're addicted to food because of that, that voice in their head that says they're not good enough. And so they go and they, they numb it that way, or they numb it another way, or, you know, there's all different kinds of, I think, addictions, obviously not, um, not to the extent and level of destruction like yours maybe, but, um, people who are struggling with that voice in their head, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm ashamed of who I am. Um, not a whole lot of self-confidence, not a whole lot of self-worth. Now you're in a place where you seem to have a, a, a healthy amount of self-confidence and self-worth, not, not a puffed up ego that has to step in, 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 in way of that, but more like a, I'm doing good. Like I'm helping people. This is, how did you get there? Tell, tell me a little bit about that for those people who maybe are, are feeling really low in that area. I mean, the biggest, I think part of the process, and this, this may sound like cliche, but I mean, was to talk about it. Like I couldn't. I didn't talk about any of my problems, my dad's death, my, I felt that I was, you know, overweight my whole, whole life. You know, I, I'm less than, you know, and I, it was really during that time in my aftercare that I was able to focus with a therapist and with a group of people. Uh, group therapy was like unbelievable to me and my, and aiding in my recovery, like going through it with other people that mm. know everything about me. This is how I'm feeling. When you say this, like it makes me feel that way. Um, like I had to, tr I had to get so, like vulnerable to the point of uncomfortability because mm. had I not, I would be sniffing Oxycontin right now. Wow. Um, and when I say vulnerable, I just mean like opening the floodgates, like really yeah. expressing where I was at, why I felt the way I did, um, to a group of people. Uh, I think that was the biggest thing. I used to live with someone who, who connectedness was their biggest thing. And I try and push that now. I need to be connected. This doesn't work. I don't work mm -hmm. solo. It, yeah. do, it doesn't work. My life spirals out of control. I need to be connected with a group of people, uh, and feel connectedness. Um, mm. And through that is how I progressed. And it's interesting how your addiction took you to a place of even more isolation. Yeah. That's kind of what you described, right? Like, so like it was even pulling you away from what you needed in, in an emotional way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. I think of when you, when you say that 
group therapy and like sharing, there's this, there's this passage in the scriptures that says, confess your sins to one another so that times of refreshing may come. And it's very interesting. Not that I'm necessarily saying you're confessing sins, but like, I do think there's this thing of like unloading those deep voices in our head that we don't want to tell anybody we have about ourselves or the shame that we're working through or whatever, that the moment you like share it, there's this like feeling of like, Oh, that's refreshing. It's almost like uh, another passage that says like carry one another's burdens. It's like the burden has been like shared now with people who have my best interests and at, at heart, you know, and who can actually like help me work through this. So, so the recovery community to you has, would you say like been a support through a lot of that? Like, I mean, as far as like, um, I'm curious in this way, obviously you're, you're mentioning community, but would you also say the, the, so the, the community, but also the steps, what yeah. was, what was more, I guess, well, I guess they're both, it's hard to say one was, one's more important than the other. Cause they both kind of point toward each other in a lot of ways, but like, um, you had group therapy while you were in, in my, after, then? Yeah. my, yeah. When I was at the, uh, halfway house for like okay. nine months, okay. we, we kind of had like group therapy. And during that time is when I got my first sponsor, and okay. really dove into the yeah. steps and, and fourth, fifth step is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, t- like sharing this stuff with, with another human being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how was the inventory? How was the, the inventory piece? <laughs> uh, it took some time. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a big one. Yeah. Uh, and the resentments I had were, you know, towards people. It, it was, yeah. I was a, I was a very sick guy mm. uh, that needed a lot of help and, and I was lucky enough to get it, but you don't know, you know, you can't, I couldn't, like you said, like the sponsor and the community part, like they both went so hand in hand. Definitely. Uh, Did you have to work through a lot with your family in that time when you were going through the steps? Cause I know a lot of the steps for people that I've seen go through the steps, they've got to then kind of go back to family and be like, I messed up back here and you might not even have known I messed up, but I need to let you know some things or, you know, confess yeah. some things. And I mean, the, my amends list to my family was huge. Yeah. yeah. My mom, my sister, my, you know, my stepmom, it mm. was, it was enormous. And Hey mom, you know, the half your jewelry collection, I'm, you know, that I pawned, like, I, like there Oof. was a lot of stuff wow. that I had to, had to really share. And, and now I can say that they know, my family knows everything about me. Like I don't have to lie anymore. I don't have to keep secrets anymore. Like they know everything. And that was a process. Uh, and still is, it'll always be a process, sure. you know, I'm still, if I go home and I'm around my mom for a couple of days, of course I can get, we get into a little argument or something like sure. that's normal. Like normal yeah. stuff happens. Um, but like our, in terms of just relationship in general, the growth has been unbelievable, um, through just really getting raw and honest. Hey mom, this is what I did. You know, this time I was actually, yeah. you know, I went home I'll like point out pictures and I'll be like, Oh God, I was, you know, I was fucked up there. Like, yeah. um, so tell me there's, there's another question I have as, as a leader. Cause now that's what you are. You, you lead like you're leading. Uh, one of the things as a leader, um, that becomes really clear and this isn't even for people just in addiction. This is clear for people, just leaders in general, self care is really important because mm-hmm. you're often pouring yourself out into other people and especially in yours. Cause yours is, is really for the emphasis of caring for others and giving people, um, you know, a lot of people are relying on you would be the way of saying it. Does that make sense? Like yeah. not that you're their source, uh, but uh, cause that can be an unhealthy relationship, but ultimately that, that you are a resource in their, in their, uh, journey of recovery. And that can feel like a pretty heavy burden at times. And it can uh, apply a lot of stress and it can also just apply a sense of like, I'll be unhealthy for the sake of aiding them in their health. And some people make that exchange, right? And so um, how do you maintain your self-care as you're also now providing care for others? Because that's that's a question that I think um, is universal of leaders everywhere, especially leaders who are helping people. But with your background, it's even more important, I think, that, I mean, it's important for everyone to have self-care. But in your particular case, Self-care for someone else might, might be not going to the gym for three, three months or something. You know what I mean? But <laughs> self-care in your case could mean like a complete change in your entire circumstance and back on a destructive road. So how are you holding on to your sobriety while also and, and, and having self-care 
while also pouring into other people? What's the balance you've discovered there in that place? I mean, that's a, a phenomenal question. And it takes, it's still a learning process because I, I don't yeah. think I've mastered it yet, to be honest. I'm, you know, I manage a full-time job, school full-time, and and these guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I take at least one day a week. Uh, I mean, on my days, on the weekends, like there's always one day where me and my girlfriend will go out, we'll do something, you know, just us. Uh, I need to, there has to be time spent away from like recovery, but at the same point, even like going to an AA meeting where like, I don't know anyone, like going to one separate from other people, like sure. that's a form of self care for me. Cause I can, no, that's I, good. I feel like I can talk about more. I can, you know, there's, there's not people that I either live with or know, you know, around me. Um, but I think, yeah, it's just really getting time away, you know, and not, I'll even say this. So I like, I like going on like a drive by myself or something. And, and it almost, it doesn't bring me back to like the isolation piece to active addiction, like how bad things got, but yeah. even just like an hour or two of like music in the car by myself, you know what I mean? Phone on do not disturb or whatever, yeah. like, like not focused on work or school like that, that does something for me and it, and it clears me out. Sure. Um, I try and go to the, you know, the beach back home, uh, during when it's warmer and cold, really whenever it's like my happy place. Yeah. Um, which is a huge, you know, stress reliever, self care. But I, I do yeah. deal with a lot of stress, uh, I'm still a big fan of nicotine, so I guess yeah. <laughs> that that helps. If if we if sure. you want me to be honest, sure, um, no. yeah. Uh, but the self care piece, yeah, it is. Uh, these guys, like, I feel. I don't want to say they like look up to me, but yes, like I I have genuine care for them, and and for me to I have genuine love for them, and for me to do that, I have to take care of myself and be able to to set up. I need to be in a place where I can do that. Yeah. Uh, and if I'm not, I'm not effective at what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. So really just taking time throughout the week, whether it's, you know, a short time for meditation in the morning, uh, 10 minutes before I get going. I love, you know what I mean? Or at the end of the night, um, I would set up little boundaries. I set up a rule like when I get home from work at 11 o'clock at night, as soon as like I step into the shower and like the water touches me, I can't think about work anymore. Like that's when I shut my mind off work mode and I'm in home mode. Yeah. Uh, you know, like small yeah. stuff. Well, like it's that. hard when you live in a community of people. I, I've, I lived in an intentional community in Boston where we had, I don't know, something like 10 to 12 people in the house together. And it was, you know, all surrounded around like, uh, all, all people doing like different missions work in Boston and so we would, we would get together every morning for like, you know, meditations together. And like, there was just, there, there was a lot, uh, but like, it's very difficult to actually find home to be a sanctuary of sorts when you live with a bunch of people. Um, and these were for the most part, healthy people <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah. not, and not that, not that I'm saying the house you're in is not healthy. I'm saying they didn't have the same needs and, and I wasn't in the position of, leadership either. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we were all equals. Does yeah. that make sense outside yeah. of the people who were the, uh, I guess kind of house parents. Um, but even in that, in that environment, um, it was hard sometimes to come home and be like, okay, that was a long day of work. I just want to relax. And then someone being like, Hey, let's hang out. Let's do this. Let's do that. And you're like, uh, I don't want to be a jerk, but I kind of just want to chill in my room. But I guess, we'll, yeah, let's play you know, a card game or something, you know, like, and then you, you, that, that slope can slide. Like if you don't create boundaries, like what you're saying, like the moment, the moment I get in the shower, I'm done. Like I'm clocked out. Like yeah. that's a good, healthy boundary to put in place or things like that, that are able to be sustained, but ultimately able to sustain you. Like I think is the, the big thing. That's, that's cool that you're learning those different patterns to create. Yeah. And I think there's still time to, you know, there's still a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's been, you know, it's been a journey in terms of, in terms of that, but small little boundaries like that. And just my dog even, you know what I mean? Like yeah. taking him for a walk small, you know, just, just getting me time, uh, yeah. is incredibly important. So you got six people in the program now and you're going to, th those people like coming into the next school year will then go into what you call a step down house mm -hmm. and then you'll also have, you'll have a new class coming in. Wow. We'll have, yeah. Five, six new guys coming in. Wow. That's amazing. Um, 
It's exciting. It's yeah. amazing. Nervous, of course, but but it's exciting. Yeah. Uh, Where do you see yourself in five years? That's a great, that's a great <laughs> question. You threw, slip that one right oh, in. Just slide it oh, right in there. Yeah, right in there. <laughs> uh, things are going. Uh, having a family. Uh, things are going well. I think with mm. I think with my girlfriend right now. Yeah. Um, She's gonna find out one way or another she if she listens to this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, Katie. Um, <laughs> things are uh, things are going well. So you know, graduate a family, with. graduating. You know, my career. You know, I would like to be in a. You know, obviously, eventually, I won't be living at with these guys anymore. So, in a spot, you know, working for either Karen or for for a treatment center in like a position of just I love the 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 collegiate recovery aspect, like the okay. that age group. Like I feel like that's such an issue right now, like countrywide, that that I could help. Uh, and having all this experience yeah. of of living with them and and going through this, like. I truly believe in five years, I don't know, like Mm. whether it means developing new programming or, you know, career advancements in general, but settling down a little bit, taking a little bit of the chaos out of my life, probably, um, you know, by not living with everyone, (laughs) Uh, I'm 29 years old. So, you know, we'll, I'll probably, I'll, I'll be there until at least I graduate. So, uh, 30, 30, you know, something like that. But, uh, I don't see myself getting high. That's awesome. I'll say that. That's very cool, CJ. Well, it's been great talking to you, man. I, I really enjoyed hearing your story, hearing what you're passionate about. I think it's so encouraging for anybody who's out there who thinks whatever their wound is, is has has finished them. That even when you're, if you're listening to this and you're at rock bottom, like there's there's hope, there's a possibility. And if it is addiction that you're working through. What would be your advice to somebody who's listening to this and they have an addiction and that addiction is is in a place where it's either manageable or manageable enough to where they know they're slowly ruining their life, but they don't know how to get help? What would you tell somebody in that position? That there may be a part of you that, that you can, you know that this is going to end bad or this is going to progress your addiction. Uh, you have that same pit in your stomach that I had at that time. Um ask for help, do it now, avoid the, the years of hell that you don't have to go through, uh, by reaching out to someone now, talk about it. Like the stigma is ending with addiction. Like I'm tired of the, of the addiction. Oh my God, dirty addict stigma. Like that's ending. Like Mm. it's okay to talk about this now to somebody, a therapist, a friend, a counselor, a family, Mm -hmm. somebody like we don't view as a society as, as, you know, we're, we're changing that the, the view of a, of an alcoholic, you know, drinking out of a brown paper bag, like that's ending that stigma. Like if you, if you're listening to this and you, you know, you know, something's not right. Um, I urge you to talk about it with somebody, get it out there. There's no, you don't have to keep it a secret because it, I did. And it, it brought me, you know, a lot of unwanted uh, feelings and emotions. Mm. Um, you can you can get through this. You can talk about it. And there are resources out there now to help you. Mm. So good. CJ, thank you so much for being on the Beyond Boundaries podcast. Thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate it. Another episode is in the books. I want to thank CJ for being on with me. If you'd like to learn more about Karen's College Success Program, you can reach out and contact CJ Hollowack at his email. That's C Hollowack, H O L O W A C H, at Karen, C A R O N dot org. Also, you can learn more about Karen and the great work they're doing. That's C A R O N. Org. And uh, if you want to make a con- contribution uh, to the great work that CJ and the team at LVC are doing, you can go find uh, the donate button on the Karen website and type in these special instructions. Please allocate uh, this donation towards Collegiate Success Department, Pennsylvania, Lebanon Valley College. I'll say that one more time. Please allocate this donation towards Collegiate Success Department, Pennsylvania Lebanon Valley College. 
It was great to have you with me today on the Beyond Boundaries podcast. If you want to learn more about me or find the show notes, you can go to pastorjustindouglas.com. You can interact there with feedback, comments, and questions, or you can reach out via Instagram. I'm at Pastor Justin Douglas. Please again, share the episode, especially this one, like how hopeful this might be for some people. So, I mean, if you know some people in your life who've maybe gone through addiction or you know somebody who, who this just might be really hopeful for them because they've gone through something difficult and they're struggling to find their purpose amidst that, this might be a really cool one to share with people. So please subscribe, rate, review, and share. May you go and live a life that is beyond boundaries, giving others love, exploring new ideas, and championing belonging.